Well, welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey Hydrography Webinar Series. This is the first of several sessions scheduled to be given about every six weeks. My name is Jeff Simley, and I'll be your host for today's April 9th session. Also working with me on this webinar series is Al Ray. Al will be the host of our next session on May 21st. Al and I are the co-leads for the USGS Hydrography Program. Logistics for today. Um, logistics for today, we'll put everyone on mute during the presentation to help filter out distracting sounds. We will monitor the chat feature of WebEx for questions from participants and send chat to everyone. If we cannot address all the questions submitted, we will follow up with responses in the next few days. Also, we would appreciate your assistance with three short feedback questions after the presentation, but before we close about the session and topics you will find of interest for future sessions. Our purpose for this webinar series is to share success stories from users who have solved real-world problems using hydrographic data, provide information on the NHD, WBD, and related products, and provide a forum for users similar to what might be encountered in a conference setting. Topics that we'll be covering in the series includes hydrology, resource management, pollution control, fisheries, emergency management, mapping, and elevation hydrography integration. The format of these seminars will cover use cases, underlying technology, rapid fire sessions, and collect feedback. We'll hold the seminar series about once every six weeks. We'll provide information on the seminar series in a number of ways. First, you can go to the NHD website, nhd.usgs.gov, and click on Hydrography Seminar Series. Second, you will find information in the monthly NHD newsletter. Third, we will have information available through the American Water Resources Association. And fourth, we will have you on a mailing list from this seminar, and you'll receive notices by email. Fifth, you can sign up to get on the mailing list if you're not already registered. Our session today will be in four parts. First, I will give an introduction to the series by discussing the role of hydrography at the USGS. Second, I will give a brief history on how we got to where we are today with the NHD. Then Dr. William Samuels will give a talk on river spill and the incident command center, incident command tool for drinking water protection. That will be followed by a discussion you are invited to have with Dr. Samuels. Let's start by looking at how hydrography fits into the USGS. At the US Geological Survey, Core Science Systems is an organization that provides data about Earth and its resources in a format that is understandable and accessible. One of the ways it does this is through the National Geospatial Program, which organizes, maintains, and publishes the geospatial baseline of the nation's topography through the national map. The underlying foundation of topography consists of surface elevations and the hydrography that shapes and is shaped by that surface. The USGS provides a geospatial fabric of surface elevations through its three-dimensional elevation program, or 3 depth. Complementing this, the USGS provides a geospatial fabric of hydrography in two data sets. The first is the National Hydrography data set. The second is the Watershed Boundary data set. Combined, these two data sets identify water courses on the landscape and the drainage basins that contain them. <clears throat> Combined again with elevation data, we have created a highly detailed and accurate account of the foundational elements of the landscape. This is available seamlessly across the nation, is easily accessible to all, and ready to use by all sectors of science, resource management, and commerce. Importantly, these data are designed to allow us to perform analytics thereby increasing the power of the data beyond mapping and giving us answers to many questions about the landscape. An example is the ability to navigate the nation's waterways and instantly measure the length of networks. We can also look at elevation data and make landscape measurements, such as instantly determining the area of a basin, and taking that one step further to generate drainage catchments. Capabilities of these data have led to powerful interactive analytical systems like StreamStats 
that can estimate the water flows of rivers and streams for a wide variety of conditions. 3DEP, the NHD, and the WBD are all critical components that make this possible. <clears throat> Similarly, the NHD Plus uses these data along with other landscape characteristics to estimate flow on a massive scale across the nation and provide this in an enhanced geospatial data set. <clears throat> A great example of integrating geospatial data to understand the complex analysis is GeoFin, developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for examining the ability of fish to reach upstream spawning grounds. This begins with the USGS NHDs represent streams and rivers. These rivers and streams have been enhanced by the U.S. Forest Service, working as stewards of the NHD data. Those, two, those streams declared impaired are mapped by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency using the NHD. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers identifies dams on rivers that have the potential to block fish from swimming upstream. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the state of California have identified locations on the NHD where fish movement is potentially restricted by culverts, waterfalls, and rapids. Another application of the NHD is to identify water rights in the state of California to make it easier for the state to adjudicate water rights. In a similar manner, the US EPA uses the NHD to identify the location of water discharge permits that helps manage the allocation of permits. The NHD that makes these and other systems possible maps streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, ditches, water diversions, stream gauges, dams, and a range of other surface water features that would typically be shown on topographic maps. It also identifies the flow direction of water that makes upstream, downstream cause and effect analysis possible. One of the major issues in mapping of hydrography is to determine how much detail to show. The fractal nature of flow networks as it collects water on the landscape means that we can map streams down to an extremely dense level. The cost to collect, manage, and utilize data beyond, is beyond the resources available. So we reduce the stream portrayal to a manageable level. This is an example of streams that would be collected at 1 to 100,000 scale. As we increase the resolution of the map to 1 to 24,000 scale, there is a need to show even more streams in a denser pattern as we see here. Then as we increase the resolution of the map even further to 1 to 5,000 scale, a new level of density can be generated. The question is where to stop. That can be hard to say because scientists and managers are analyzing the landscape at ever enlarged scales and demanding more and more data. Feeding this need are vastly improved methods to obtain this level of data at costs that are generally affordable. Next, we'll look at a brief history of hydrography data that has given rise to the NHD of today. The mapping of water in the United States has a rich history. That history could be said to begin before the New World was discovered by Europeans. This petroglyph found in the lands once occupied by the Shoshone people in Idaho is known as Map Rock and is believed to map the Snake River. These pre-European maps can be said to make up the first era of mapping water on the continent. The second era of mapping water in North America started in 1507 with European exploration that lasted through 1870, with exploration that lasted through 1878. Throughout this period, the most prominent feature found on maps was rivers. Then, in 1879, the U.S. Geological Survey was created to, quote, begin a scientific classification of the national domain for general information, unquote. The great surveys of the West were discontinued and brought under the auspices of the USGS. In 1889, funds were allocated specifically for topographic surveys. The first maps were one degree in size and used a scale of 1 to 250,000, but this, was quickly, this quickly transitioned to the 30 minute by 30 minute size at 1 to 125,000 scale, as seen on this map of Little Rock, Arkansas. These maps would launch the systematic coverage of the United States with quadrangle topographic maps. 
By 1935, the USGS was producing maps at 1 to 24,000 scale in a 7.5 minute by 7.5 minute format that defines topographic mapping in the United States to this day. The area covered by this map is 1 16th of the previous map and shows the land to the northwest of Little Rock in the North Little Rock Quadrangle. A contour interval of 10 feet means great precision of the topography, including hydrography. Maps of the 1930s and 40s still use ground survey methods. In the 1930s, aerial photography was introduced into the map making process. In the 1940s, the science of photogrammetry, the measurement of photos, matured to the point where it could be used systematically in mapping. This is the 1954 edition of the North Little Rock Quad, which incorporated photogrammetric methods. Photogrammetry made updating the hydrography much easier. This 2014 edition introduces the U.S. Topo product and a new type of mapping. The U.S. Topo process uses digital mapping techniques to construct maps in which all the base information, including hydrography, has been converted to digital format and the finished map is then produced in an all-digital environment. We'll call this period of mapping national large-scale systematic mapping that started in 1879 and lasted to the present time as era three in the mapping of hydrography. It is characterized by a number of revolutions in technology that has allowed increased resolution, increased accuracy, increased frequency, and decreased the resources necessary to map the country. Overlapping with the third era of mapping is the fourth era, characterized by geographic information systems. This began in the 1960s with computers and computer printout graphics. At first, digital maps were rather crude, but they were a milestone. The age of hand-drafted maps is now giving way to computer-drafted maps. This is a map of water turbidity in Lake Mendota in Wisconsin. The technology steadily improved throughout the 1970s with vector plotters. In the 1980s, mapping was transformed by many computers and interactive computer graphics. This allowed cartographers to rapidly create different mapping scenarios and made integrating, relating, measuring, and analyzing data much faster and more accurate. In the 1980s, the systematic digitizing of maps became commonplace. Maps now existed as databases within a computer environment. To better manage the information, data themes were created. Water on most maps was printed in blue. The materials used to make the blue printing plate were digitized separately from other materials. The information collected in this manner was organized in separate database files. The files with water were referred to as the hydrography theme. Maps made using geographic information system maps made using geographic information systems were composed of multiple themes. Hydrography was established as one of the primary themes of topography. The USGS became heavily involved in digital mapping when the US Census Bureau produced a digital hydrography theme for their 1990 census maps. These maps were produced at 1 to 100,000 scale and provided nationwide coverage. They were called digital line graphs or DLGs. The U.S. Census version of this data was known as Tiger Data. In the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency had begun to model the flow of water in a geographic information system using hydrography data digitized from 1 to 250,000 scale aeronautical charts that had been photo reduced to 1 to 500,000 scale. EPA modeled the flow of water using a flow network in a data set called RF1. By the late 1980s, the RF3 at 1 to 100,000 scale was developed by the EPA's Office of Water to provide a nationally consistent database to promote comparability for national, regional, and state reporting requirements, such as those found in 305B and other sections of the Clean Water Act. In the RF3 and RF1, streams were broken into segments. By piecing the stream segments together, river networks were established and the flow of water throughout the nation strainage networks could be analyzed by computer modeling software. Combining digital cartography and hydrologic modeling in a geographic information system was a milestone in the evolution of geographic science. In 1993, the USGS and the EPA realized they could combine their two hydrography programs to produce a new improved flow network for the nation at 1 to 100,000 scale. 
It would improve resolution as well as produce a data set with a flow network suitable for environmental modeling. The combined data became the National Hydrography Data Set. Several years of joint development and planning by the USGS and the EPA finally led to the production of the National Hydrography Data Set, which was completed in 2002. The data set was an immediate success and was put to use by scientists and resource managers around the country. Even as the NHD was being produced, data users began to inquire about the possibility of increasing the resolution. The USGS had been digitizing its 1 to 24,000 scale maps, but digitizing and processing over 55,000 maps to provide nationwide coverage was too large of a task for a single agency. Drawing interest led to a combined effort by states, federal agencies, and soon the 1 to 24,000 scale NHD, now known as the high resolution NHD, was developed. By pulling resources of some of the 60 partnering agencies, the USGS was able to complete the production of high resolution NHD for the nation in 2007. Paralleling the development of the NHD was the development of the Watershed Boundary Data Set, or WBD, jointly produced by the USGS and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. This data set defines the perimeters of watersheds, or drainage areas, on the landscape and was completed in 2010. The NHD and WBD are companion data sets that create a comprehensive water information system easily accessible by to thousands of water scientists. They create a systematic approach to mapping rivers, lakes, and watersheds across the nation. During this period, the EPA was developing the 1 to 100,000 scale NHD in a significant new direction. All streams are different. Each one is uniquely characterized by the amount of water that flows through it. This is largely determined by the upstream drainage area, precipitation, and other landscape and geologic factors. If the drainage areas can be determined, it would be possible to include a variety of other factors into the model. It would estimate stream flow for each segment of a stream. This would give scientists a huge boost in their ability to model the nature of the nation's waters. To determine drainage areas, the National Elevation Data Set produced by the USGS was used along with watershed boundaries found in the Watershed Boundary Data Set. This new form of the NHD data set, integrating watershed data, elevation data, and landscape data would become known as the NHD Plus, and it was completed in 2006. It marked yet another milestone in the development of geospatial data. The stream flow and velocity estimates embedded in the NHD, the data set was transformed into an even more valuable and useful water information system that made major improvements in how water could be analyzed. The so-called fourth era, or GIS era, in the mapping and analysis of water has made a huge impact on water science and management. What's next for the computer analysis of digital and hydrography data? LIDAR data will certainly play an important role in recording or understanding of the landscape. Also, the web will likely transform how we interact with geospatial data through the use of data delivery and analytical services. It is also probable that new innovations will influence the future of water analysis and create yet another new era in hydrography. It is safe to bet that these changes will come with greater and greater frequency as technology rapidly advances over the years. The NHD, WBD, and National Elevation Data Set produced by the USGS provide a triad of geospatial data to define the topography of the nation. This has revolutionized scientific hydrographic observation data collection and analysis. It is now possible to integrate many types of water information in geographic information systems and model the behavior of water to better inform us on how we manage our water resources. In today's talk, Dr. Samuels will be talking about West Virginia. Let's take a quick look at the NHD for West Virginia. Hydrography data was first digitized in the 1990s. By 2004, the high-resolution NHD was completed for the state. In the 2005 to 2012 timeframe, NHD data at 1 to 4,800 scale resolution was produced. In the 2013 to 2016 timeframe, the NHD is being used in the development of, development of stream stats. The current focus of the NHD is the changing, is the changing hydrography associated with surface mining. <clears throat> Our featured speaker today is Dr. William Samuels from the Center of Water Science and Engineering at LIDOS Incorporated in Alexandria, Virginia. 
Victor Samuels will speak on River Spill, an Incident Command Tool for Drinking Water Protection. Victor Samuels is the director of the Center for Water Science and Engineering at Lidos, formerly SAIC. Lidos is a science and technology company working to address problems in national security, health, and engineering. He is currently the principal investigator for the Waterborne Transport Modeling Program sponsored by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. So Bill, we'll turn this over to you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about an application of this tool called the IC Water, or the Incident Command Tool for Drinking Water Protection, and how it was used uh, during the West Virginia chemical spill that occurred uh, in January. 2014. As uh, with the case of drinking water protection, um, when a hazardous material is released into a river that serves as a, a source water or drinking water supply, um, uh, protection and contamination risk mitigation requires that information on the uh, fate of waterborne contaminants be made available uh, quickly to decision makers. And uh, so what happened um, in January of uh, 2014 was that a, um, a chemical spill of uh, um, four methyl cyclohexane methanol, which is a foaming agent used in coal preparation, uh, leaked from a tank at Freedom Industries into the Elk River. And uh, this particular tank was about one mile upstream from the intake for the Charleston uh, water supply. Uh, on January 19th, in the morning, about 8.15 or so, the Charleston residents uh, noticed a sweet smell in the air. And uh, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection began receiving odor complaints from Charles, uh, Charleston residents. Uh, later on that morning, um, at, at the Freedom Industries uh, tank facility, two employees noticed a leak from a tank into the containment area um, uh, surrounding it. And then later on that morning, about 11 o'clock, uh, Department of Environmental Protection inspectors um, were there. Uh, they discovered the leak in response to the uh, residents' complaints about odor. Uh, and when they arrived at the facility, they observed that this chemical, MCHM, was leaking through a con concrete uh, block a containment dike. Uh, later on, um, about noon, uh, West Virginia American Water, which operates the uh, water treatment plant for Charleston, uh, became aware of the spill. Um, they assumed that they could filter it, uh, but by about 4 p.m., uh, when their carbon filtration system could no longer handle this large amount of contamination in the water, uh, the chemical began flowing through the carbon filter and uh, entered the distribution system. Uh, some additional information uh, about uh, what uh, occurred at the, at the site when inspectors went out there. Uh, they noticed a four-foot wide stream of chemical liquid uh, flowing across the floor of the containment dike and into the ground where the dike's wall joined its floor. And uh, in addition, uh, they uh, found a uh, approximately 400 square foot size uh, uh, stream um, outside the damaged uh, white stainless uh, tank area. And um, that material then leaked from the containment area into the ground um, and then traveled um, into the Elk River. And so you see in this particular picture a uh, location of the tank facilities and um, the uh, uh, proximity to, uh, to the uh, Elk River system. Uh, so um, what did we do? Uh, we actually uh, received a call from um, the Greater Cincinnati Water Works, which is a downstream facility uh, um, that was concerned about that particular contamination. Um, it was too late uh, to do anything in terms of uh, the Charleston area, but downstream utilities, and particularly Cincinnati, were concerned about protecting their water supplies. And so uh, we started to make some runs of 
the uh, icy water uh, model. And so uh, the model consists of a number of components. It's the NHD Plus that Jeff had just previously described. We couple that with uh, USGS real-time stream gauges so we can uh, uh, update the flows and velocities in the NHD Plus with real-time data. Uh, we have a, uh, a database of assets, which includes drinking water intakes, municipal and industrial uh, dischargers, um, um, emergency uh, sites like uh, fire stations, police stations, and other critical facilities like hospitals and schools. And then also a contaminant database, which has several hundred contaminants ranging from chemical, biological, and, and radiological materials with information about their toxicities, maximum contaminant levels, physical and chemical properties used for modeling. Uh, this system is GIS-based. River Spill is the modeling engine uh, that we use. A user interacts with it um, by uh, identifying the location of the incident and defining the source term, whether it be instantaneous or continuous, uh, how much was released, what was released. And, uh, and then the uh, um, river spill model will perform the hydraulic transport downstream. The outputs include a downstream trace, uh, which can be limited either by distance or time. Uh, that trace can be interrogated at any location to get a breakthrough curve, which is concentration as a function of time. And uh, the system can also be run in the reverse direction actually uh, look at an upstream trace. So if you had a uh, detection at some site and you're interested in the possible locations of where that might have come from, you can run the model in the reverse direction and start looking at upstream uh, sources of contamination. Um, so it's designed for, uh, to uh, work uh, in emergency management cases as well as uh, planning and contingency operations. So we set it up to try to use minimal input data, fairly simple user interface. Uh, to get an answer very quickly to an emergency responder. By using the NHD Plus, we can perform hydraulic transport on any stream in the NHD Plus network. And we try to uh, select uh, uh, water quality state variables that control the major processes um, and parameters available from that uh, national database. So the system is designed to answer four basic questions. Where is the contaminant going? Is there a drinking water intake in its path? If so, uh, when will it reach drinking water? And is the level of that contaminant high enough to be a human threat? The modeling principles uh, behind um, uh, icy water, uh, with respect to the source term, a spill can be um, modeled as being an instantaneous release or a continuous release over some period of time. We make some assumptions about mixing. In this case, uh, uh, we're assuming uh, instantaneous and complete mixing in the water column. Uh, the velocity data, we, we take the uh, mean flow and velocity data from the NHD Plus, and we scale it based on measurements from USGS real-time gauges, or in some cases, um, flow forecasts and velocity forecasts from the uh, NOAA or National Weather Service or River Forecast Center. We have a one-dimensional longitudinal dispersion model, and we also model first-order decay for um, chemical contaminants, and, um, and that equation is modified by temperature for biological um, contaminants. So this is what the interface looks like uh, for this particular area. Uh, you see a map of the, uh, of the NHD Plus, uh, the spill site there, um, and then uh, very closely downstream is the location of the intake. Um, we, uh, you notice a number of gauges, uh, and the one gauge that's very close uh, just downstream of the intake it was one of the gauges that we used for the real-time flow data. Uh, when we interrogate that gauge, in this case, we were able to retrieve real-time flow um, and also real-time velocity. Uh, in the um, uh, user interface down in the lower left of this screen, uh, we're reporting um, the flow uh, from that gauge uh, and the velocity. And then we're looking also at the, um, 
average flow and average velocity from the NHD, and we make some scaling factors based on uh, comparisons of those two flows, and we can then apply those scaling factors uh, downstream until we get to the next gauge, and then we update it uh, as we move downstream. Um, so uh, some outputs. Um, here uh, is we're actually looking at the entire flow regime from the, uh, where the spill occurred on the right-hand side of the screen all the way down about 200 miles or so along the uh, Kanawha River and then the Ohio River uh, to Cincinnati. You can see a number of gauges there. Um, the, the most immediate gauge was reporting flow and velocities. The other downstream gauges were reporting only um, water elevation. And, and so uh, we were able to actually get from those other gauge sites um, uh, information from the uh, National Weather Service uh, Ohio River Forecast Center, which we use to update the mean flows and velocities in the NHD Plus. Information uh, about the um, uh, water intakes is stored in the EPA Safe Drinking Water Information System, or SIDWIS. Uh, we can uh, interrogate any, any uh, intake in the system. It'll go out to SIDWIS and bring up information about the population served, uh, as well as uh, contact information for the plant so that a notice or uh, a warning could be uh, called in or, or sent to them. So one of the first questions that were asked uh, when the spill occurred was, where is it going to be in 24 hours? So this is a 24-hour trace from the, um, from the site of the spill. We color the, um, the trace um, red, um, yellow, or blue, depending upon whether it's above the level of concern, uh, in transition, or below the level of concern. And in addition, here you see on this map, uh, we're plotting other um, assets from our database. So there are many other discharges downstream. Uh, both municipal and industrial. There are several toxic uh, release inventory sites, uh, a few hospitals, uh, and other facilities that may be uh, of interest to uh, users to see what the environment looks like downstream. The types of, uh, of results that we were reporting, uh, we made some comparisons with uh, measurements and observations that were being collected by um, West Virginia and other um, um, agencies downstream so we could compare our model results with field observations. And we had that data for Charleston, for Huntington, West Virginia, where there was another intake, and also for Cincinnati. And uh, we were comparing both the uh, time of travel of the peak concentration as well as the um, max concentration, both uh, from the observations as well as the icy water simulated um, forecast. Uh, you can see uh, from uh, looking at this data that in some cases the results uh, with, with respect to time of travel were, were very, very close. Um, at Huntington, um, the observed peak was at 90 hours after the spill. The simulated results was 84 hours. And the concentrations were quite close in terms of peak concentrations. At Cincinnati, Again, very close with respect to time of travel. Um, the icy water uh, model uh, underpredicted uh, what was observed with respect to the peak concentration. Um, but still, the results were used by the decision makers um, to, um, to make some decisions about closing their intake and then reopening it. And uh, here's the breakthrough curve uh, for Cincinnati. And so what did the folks in Cincinnati do? Uh, with some of this information. Uh, the water utility shut down its intake shortly before midnight on Tuesday, January 14th, was, which was 136 hours after the spill, assuming the spill began around 8 a.m. on January 9th. And this was a precautionary measure to protect its drinking water supply. Um, the contaminant MCHM was first detected in the Ohio River near the uh, Greater Cincinnati Water Works Richard Miller Treatment Plant on Wednesday, January 15th at approximately 7 a.m., which was 143 hours after the spill. And uh, icy water uh, predicted a time of arrival of the peak concentration at 
about 150 hours or 2 p.m. on January 15th. And then the uh, uh, Cincinnati uh, uh, Waterworks uh, reopen their intake approximately 2 p.m. on January 16th, about 174 hours of the, after the spill. So you can see all those events um, plotted on this particular uh, graph here. Um, the, uh, the smooth curve uh, is the icy water uh, breakthrough curve uh, forecast. Uh, the uh, diamond um, um, symbols are the measurements. And um, you can see there that uh, the uh, um, peak uh, time of arrival for the maximums occur, um, corresponded quite closely. And um, the uh, maximum observed peak was uh, about six parts per billion uh, higher than uh, what um, was um, predicted by icy water. So there are a number of challenges associated with this particular event, um, particularly with uncertainty of input parameters. Um, the spill duration, how long did the uh, uh, chemical actually leak from the tank, and what kind of release pattern uh, did it show? Was it continuously releasing over a period of time, or were there um, sort of ups and downs? Did it ebb and flow? And, and exactly how much volume was released? Um, initial estimates were about 5,000 gallons, and then it went up to 7,500, and then, and then finally it was agreed upon that there was a 10,000 gallons release. Toxicity levels of the contaminant were not well known. The CDC um, uh, offered a uh, toxicity level of concern of about one milligram per liter, and a lot of folks are using that as a benchmark. Um, also accounting for how much mass was lost through other downstream intakes. That was an unknown. And um, you know, taking into account the accuracy of the actual measurements that were made for model updates and comparison. Uh, and other factors with respect to uh, trying to determine uh, how the pollutant was delivered to the river, um, attenuation by the soil it, that it had to seep through, that was, again, another unknown. But there were a number of success factors uh, that led to uh, its use, uh, the model's use, as well as observations uh, for the uh, Cincinnati Waterworks. Um, the, uh, the ability to use a national river network like the NHD Plus, coupled with real-time stream flow data and river forecast data, allowed simulations of the leading edge, peak concentration, and trailing edge, from the origin of the spill to hundreds of miles uh, downstream. Uh, having uh, measurements along the way were uh, useful for updating the uh, model of forecast and for making comparisons with what was being predicted. And um, what we were finding that in, uh, with respect to travel time, very, very good agreement uh, with the uh, peak concentrations. And um, at some of the intermediate stations like Huntington, very, very good agreement with um, the um, uh, peak concentrations. And a little bit of um, uh, we were um, under uh, estimating um, at Cincinnati. So we had a number of lessons learned uh, for future um, um, experiences with this kind of uh, event and this kind of modeling. Uh, initial spill reports are um, often inaccurate. And um, you need to constantly update forecasts based on changes in the source term and also environmental conditions like the flow. Um, using both real-time gauge data and stream flow forecasts is important. Not all gauges uh, that we encountered were reporting flow. Some of them were reporting just um, um, water surface elevation. And uh, the water utility was basing their decisions not just on modeling forecasts, but also on field observations. That was important uh, to corroborate what the model was, uh, was predicting. And uh, working collaboratively with local authorities, with water utilities and data providers, were very useful in being able to get this um, modeling um, effort uh, launched. So um, just a number of conclusions. Um, for an event of this magnitude, um, I think this exercise showed the utility of a national level toxic spill model uh, to simulate the entire pathway of the spill from uh, the um, uh, tributaries upstream, like the Elk River, onto the main stem of the Ohio River. 
and that the integration of this national level stream network coupled with real-time stream flow and river forecast data as well as sampling observations uh, enable decision makers at, at this water utility uh, to take appropriate action to protect their water supply. Well, finally, I just offer uh, a little bit of further reading uh, for more details about what I presented. Uh, two recent papers, uh, one, Modeling the Fate and Transport of a Chemical Spill in the Elk River, which was recently published in the Journal of Environmental Engineering. Uh, and secondly, uh, a paper uh, published in the um, Water Environment Journal on the Incident Command Tool for Drinking Water Protection gives all the details on the equations, modeling assumptions, and applications of this particular tool. So um, that concludes my presentation, and I uh, thank everyone for their attention. Good. Thanks a lot, Dr. Samuel. So let's open it up. Um, to uh, questions via the, the chat. So um, I ask my colleagues in Reston, do you want to um, uh, bring up some of these uh, questions? Right. So Jeff, can you hear me? This is yeah. Me. Yeah. So uh, if people uh, don't see the chat, uh, there's a little tool at the top of the screen that will open up a chat window. Um, and you can ask your questions there. So we're, uh, with the number of people on uh, the line, we've decided not to open up the, the phone line itself. So if you want to ask a question, you need to type it into the chat and then send it to everyone. There's a little pull down above the chat box where uh, it asks who you want to send it to, and everyone is at the very, very top of that list. OK, uh, Dr. Samuels, we have a couple questions streaming in here. Uh, first one, uh, can the articles referenced uh, be made available to the meeting participants? Um, I guess we can post those to the NHD website, perhaps, right, Jeff? Yeah, we sure can. Okay, as part of the part of the materials here. Um, we also have a number of questions about uh, access to the IC Water Tool. Where do you get it, and uh, is it proprietary or licensed? That sort of thing. Okay, uh, I can answer that one. Um, the uh, the tool is um, was developed. Um, with funding from a number of different government agencies, including EPA, Forest Service, and the Department of Defense. And right now, it is um, maintained and, um, and developed through a contract uh, with the uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, and uh, they uh, make that, they can make that tool available to any federal, state, or local government agencies that request um, that's interested in requesting it. And I can provide um, the points of contact for making a request to uh, DTRA uh, for the tool. Um, OK, so uh, Bill, this, uh, let's see. We had a question from the New York Water Science Center uh, asking about how fast was the response? How fast were you able to respond um, to the spill and to start getting information to your clients. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we were uh, we received a call from Cincinnati, um, and uh, we were um, um, starting to get results to them within probably oh 12 hours or so. Uh, once we were able to get information about the source term and the um, uh, nature of the release, and that we, we kept sort of making updates oh, several times a day um, to provide them with some uh, updated information. Uh, the model runs took, oh, depending upon how far we were, um, we were um, doing the simulation, um, if we started at, uh, at the site of the spill and went all the way to Cincinnati, 
uh, model runs would take maybe two to three hours. If we were starting further downstream, let's say at Huntington and then going to Cincinnati, uh, we could you know, get results out in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so um, that, that, um, that gives you a, a feel for about the um, uh, nature of our response. Uh, so, Bill, I, I'd like to ask a, just a little bit of a follow-up. I know you've been working uh, on the Open Water Data Initiative uh, team that's looking at spill response, and can you give us just some idea how you think maybe uh, we might be able to change the way that this sort of response happens so we can be better prepared uh, in the future? Um. Yeah, uh, I, I think one thing that can change uh, is sort of the architecture of, of the tool. Uh, it, it's right now basically uh, it's a desktop application that runs as an extension to the ArcGIS system. And so a user then that's, needs to, um, to have it you know, set up on their system, have an Arc license, and have the data loaded. If, you, if that's all ready to go, then you can respond fairly quickly. If not, then you need to, you know, get all that uh, software installed, get the data installed, and uh, you know, learn how to use the system. I, I think uh, we could probably uh, uh, increase uh, uh, or cut down the response time if we had a, uh, a web-based version of the tool uh, where a user could, uh, you know, log in. Then all the data is, you know, sitting there on the cloud, uh, ready to go. Um, you don't have to uh, spin up uh, an ARC license and, and, uh, and load your data. And, uh, and so I think uh, moving to a more web-based uh, type client-server environment would probably uh, be uh, the next iteration of this, this kind of uh, application. OK, we've, we've had several questions about the, the uh, data that goes into the model and what kinds of things it can, it can consider. For instance, uh, would geomorphological data along the river have helped, uh, or would it consider uh, meteorological conditions or uh, ice cover on the river? Yeah, um, it's really set up uh, to look just at the uh, um, you know, hydraulic transport in the river itself in a fairly uh, um, you know, with some simplifying assumptions, particularly one-dimensional one longitudinal transport. So some of the geomorphology data along the riverbank, uh, of course, is, is of interest, but right now the model would not be able to do much with that, except maybe if we knew something about how that might influence uh, uh, how much uh, material might, uh, you know, from the total amount that was spilled, um, how much would uh, not get into the river. So it, it could, you know, use to, to help define the source term. Um, with respect to meteorological data, yeah, as, as you re recall from um, one of the graphs on the, uh, on the presentation, uh, there was, uh, uh, the flow was fairly low and steady uh, in, the, in the Tribs and in the Ohio mainstem for like the first 24 to 36 hours, and then there was a rainfall event. Uh, and you started to see the flow increasing uh, rapidly over time. So, you know, the gauges then um, do see that signal from, um, from the rainfall data, and so the flows and, and the velocities are, are going to change as a result of that. So, you know, through the, um, through the gauge data, um, these types of rainfall and meteorological events are, uh, are factored into the, uh, into the, uh, into the travel time. Okay, Bill. Uh, so we have a question from Drew Grant in the Alaska DEC, uh, and he asks, um, he never heard, really heard how toxic uh, the MCHM was, uh, and what you know. So could you address how how toxic that was, and whether um, you would need to change how you would model? something that was either more or less toxic than, than that um, particular substance? Yeah. Uh, 
what I recall was that there was not a lot known about the toxicity of this particular uh, chemical uh, uh, when this occurred. Uh, I think there were some studies done on um, uh, some animal studies with some numbers produced by the, the CDC. I think they, they came out with a level of concern of, of one milligram per liter. But uh, that was, you know, I think more of a guideline. Um, and um, the, uh, the event actually did not cause any, um, any, uh, any fatalities, any mortality as far as I know. Um, because I think a lot of people, you know, when they started to um, notice that smell in the water, um, just, you know, wouldn't drink it. Um, so from that perspective, it was, you know, a big inconvenience uh, as opposed to, I think, um, an event where a lot of people were getting sick. Uh, I think there are studies now um, that have occurred and, and may still be occurring to uh, look more closely at the toxicity of this particular um, contaminant, um, with respect to, um, and, and I don't, and, and I'd have to go back to the literature to see what you know what those studies have, have been uh, have been. Okay, we've had a couple questions about uh, basically how long it takes to learn to use the model, uh, and whether there are training opportunities. Um, specifically for using this in an emergency response? Bill, are you there? Did we lose Bill? It sounds like we did. Well, perhaps this is a good time to open the poll then. <laughs> so uh, I'll mention also that uh, we'll uh, we'll get the answers to any of the questions that we didn't get answered here in the chat. Um, go ahead and type any more questions in there that you may have, and we'll we'll get them answered um, uh, directly to to the mailing list uh, of people who attended. And so we're, we're, we have a short poll, just uh, three short questions about, uh, about the seminar. And uh, we'd appreciate it if you would take the time to uh, give, us, give us some answers to those three questions um, before we close. I'll give it back to you, Jeff, I guess. Yeah, and so just to remind everybody that there, uh, this session is being recorded, and we will have the recording available at the NHD website. It's simply uh, nhd.usgs.gov, and there is a tab there for Hydrography Seminar Series. Uh, click on that, and you'll get information about how to ex access the uh, recording of this and other information about this uh, seminar. Um, so. Also point out that um, uh, there's going to be a, another session on uh, May 21st, uh, hosted by Al Ray. It will feature um, a, a talk on uh, flood modeling. And um, so, uh, Al, do you want to say anything about that? Oh, OK, sure. Uh, so Ed Clark from the National Weather Service, who's the uh, well, flood uh, Flash Flood Coordinator for the Weather Service will be talking about the work that is going on with the National Flood Interoperability Experiment, um, and so that's uh, that's a big effort that's going on uh, that will that's working on trying to develop uh, real-time national hydrologic models that would be able to um, indicate where flooding would be occurring uh, around the country. And so we'll we'll have Ed on uh, next month uh, for that. Yeah, thank you, Al. So uh, thanks everybody for um, joining in on this presentation today, this webinar. A very fascinating talk by uh, uh, Dr. Samuels on the river spill. Very good application of geospatial data in uh, solving problems. And so we um, very appreciative of uh, Dr. Samuels for that. 
Thanks, everybody, for joining. We look forward to uh, having you join us for the next call on May 21st, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.